Most would stereotype and assume that female from Los Angeles, she has an OF, mm. good looking, gorgeous, big Instagram following, 20 men in there. You're the only female. <laughs> yep. 20 men. It's hot as shit. It smells like shit. You got world champion sparring and, and you couldn't pay attention to anybody but yourself. It's not the most eloquent way that you could say that, <laughs> but I spent so many years of my life worried about what people thought about me, how I was being perceived. And I came to realize nobody gives a fuck. It took depression. It took anxiety. It took crawling myself out of a place where I, I was at the complete opposite end of that spectrum. Before you can accept any compliment and love from others, you need to be able to take in compliments and love from yourself. Welcome to the My Estray Mentality Podcast, where I get to interview some of the dopest individuals that I've met through this amazing journey of life. Individuals with the most amazing stories and plenty of lessons to share. Every single person that we have one thing in common that has brought us together, we all have a love for boxing. But it's always been bigger than boxing. On that note, Let's get into these stories. I ran up a check, I might do it again. Enemies close, have me thinking they're friends. Ten toes down, I'll be free until the end. Crib outside the city, I don't feel safe in my ass. Took so many years, I'm just waiting for the... <laughs> On today's episode, we had the pleasure of interviewing the gorgeous Christina Ewing. Christina is a Los Angeles native, born and raised. She's a fitness professional that teaches group boxing and boot camp classes around Hollywood. But... She's also a true athlete that takes her boxing seriously. She's in the gym working with me on the daily, on the grind in that hot-ass gym. She's a model, influencer, content creator on everybody's favorite platform. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, yo? Yo, first of all, that is quite the intro. Can you write intros for me for the rest of my life? That's how I want to be announced, like, walking into places. <laughs> Every time we go out to dinner and I introduce you to new friends, That's what I I'm going to bust out my notes for today and <laughs> give give that intro. Oh, no, I want to memorize. Don't bust out the notes. And I want it to end with the emphasis on. <laughs> I know, right? I got to be careful how much I say that because I got to bleep out every time. <laughs> I was wondering about that. Okay. All right. We'll call it something else going OF going forward. Which is crazy completely off topic but it's currently like trending right now on social media about andrew do you know andrew tate yeah oh my god yeah <laughs> well anyways he got banned from all these platforms with which i don't like all his platform he got deplatformed on youtube twitter tiktok instagram no. um, because of the messages he was putting out there which i can't say i agree with all the messages because i haven't really yeah. listened to everything but um, there has been some some stuff. I'm like, okay, it makes sense there. But the way he words it is kind of like controversial. But besides the point is if you go on Twitter, you literally have yep. full on. Yep. And, and, and you have even terrorists on there tweeting and, and putting like some crazy stuff on there. But they deplatformed him. So that's the big controversy right now. But anyway, that's completely that off sense. topic. You no, know, but it does make it. I mean, it's on topic since we said the OF thing. It does make it, it raises the question of, I don't know, especially if you're talking about in the U.S. specifically, freedom of speech being allowed to say things regardless of how shitty or controversial they are you should be allowed to have a platform to say what you want so i suppose i understand what the controversy is that being said it's not the worst thing that ever happened but still it's, yeah <laughs> very interesting times we live in but i want to yeah. take this back to you obviously because okay. this is about you and getting your incredible story out there let's ease everybody into it and you know start sure. off with our basics let the audience get to know you a little bit um, what was growing up in LA like for you? Talk about your high school experience. What'd you do after high school, your college, if you went to college and, and how you ended up in the career you did now. Oh, this is going to be long. That's a long one. There's so many phases, Jer. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm st born and raised. Start off from, from I'll that. Start from yeah. the beginning. I'm born and raised in California. I'm like one of the few people that can actually say that they're a Los Angeles native. Um, I grew up in the suburbs. I grew up in um, a little town called Granada Hills. It's, pretty far north. Um, my parents both lived there. They separated when I was three, but they both lived in the same place so that I could split my time between the two. Uh, and I went to the same uh, school from the time I was in kindergarten until the time I graduated high school, kindergarten through 12th grade. I went to a small private Christian school that turned out well. 
Um, and, you and I both. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know that it imparted the values on me that they anticipated, but that's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so kindergarten through high school, I went to the same uh, place. And in high school, I don't, I wouldn't say that I necessarily peaked. Uh, maybe towards the end, like senior year, I started to get kind of more comfortable in my skin. And I only say that because I know that we'll probably get onto the topic of of confidence and that sort of thing. And so that didn't really happen in high school. Um, but I did go to college. I went to, um, I went four years. I graduated. Most people ask me that when they find out I'm on OLAF or when they find out I'm an influencer or whatever. So yes, I went to college. I don't know that I used my degree as much as I would have hoped I do, uh, but I, I got a degree in communication. Um, and I was hustling. I came from a poor uh, family and then ended up working up into a middle class family. So I've had to work for everything that I've I've got. Uh, and that was in college as well. So I worked two jobs when I was in college. I worked at a restaurant uh, in the evenings to make money. And then I also worked uh, in insurance. I worked an office job and I kept that job up until two years ago in the pandemic when I started working in fitness. And most people don't know that about me either. But yeah, I was slaying an insurance policy, sitting behind a desk, answering emails all day. And you know what? I freaking loved it for a long time. I was in a sales position. Um, but as soon as the pandemic hit, uh, I realized I was really unfulfilled in the work that I was doing. Um, the best part of my job was the connection to people. It was getting to see faces. It was getting to go to lunches. It was getting to talk. It was never about insur selling insurance. It just isn't sexy, let's be honest. It was about connecting with people and networking. And I loved that aspect of the job. And when all that was pulled away and I was just sitting behind a computer screen, I realized how unhappy I was and how unfulfilled I was and how I needed to make a change. And that's kind of how the transition into fitness happened. I had already been, you know, at multiple gyms, like working out as a client. Um, it's something that I had loved and was passionate about. And it was really the only thing that was bringing any sort of joy and fulfillment into my day. And I was like, okay, how can I utilize that? Um, to be a career and, and that's kind of what sparked wanting to get into fitness and figuring out how to to make that my job so that's where i'm at now yeah, i mean the the pandemic definitely shifted a lot of people's careers including mine and my wife's and and shifted our mindset on what we wanted to do when it came to our careers um i want to pull it back even more so two things that i could really relate to you on when you talked about you know your upbringing and 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 growing up and everything like we didn't have a ton of money either. We came from a third world country. And to see um, my parents hustle and work towards that middle class, which is crazy now, you know, we're in a recession, and everything middle class is almost like we're, we're, we're dropped down even more again, but it, oh, yeah. it was crazy. It instilled that hustle in us. And, and that's why I could really relate to you and, and vibe with you on the work ethic that we put in the gym and in our careers as well. The second thing I want to bring up is um, you talked about uh, your parents splitting when you were three. I have a three-year-old right now. Mm. Um, I could see everything. He picks up on everything we do. Even our one-year-old. I have one-year-old and three-year-old, and my three-year-old picks up on everything, like how mm. I talk to my wife, how she talks to me, how I treat him. How did that affect you? I think it gave me um, a hyper-independence. I think that a lot of times I get asked, pretty often where my motivation comes from or how I stay consistent. And I think a lot of it stems from childhood, from having to, from um, how, when you grow up with one parent or you grow up in a broken home, um, when your parent is doing the job of two parents are often tired or they have to work often or work two jobs or, and that's kind of what I grew up in. So I also had to start to kind of raise myself from a younger age. And I, I kind of had an hyper independence. Like I don't want or need for much because I do most things on my own. And I've had to kind of learn now as I've aged how to delegate and how to let people help me. Um, and that is so hard to relearn when your whole life has been, if you want something done, you have to do it yourself. If you want money, you have to work. If you want a job, you've got to put in the effort and the time. If you want to be good at boxing, you've got to put in the time and the energy. And that work ethic, while it's fantastic, it also for a long time, like in like my adolescence and probably early 20s, um, also was a catalyst for like burnout and overproduction and not allowing myself to rest and never feeling like I was accomplishing the things that I wanted to accomplish because I just kept 
pushing that goal. So it, it kind of, yeah, I would say hyper independence would be the number one thing. And still to this day, working through allowing people into my space and not trying to do everything on my own. Yo, definitely. And and I think you're very mindful about the people that you let in, even when it comes mm-hmm. to um, friendships, relationships, boys, girls, <laughs> anyone, like you're very particular on who you bring in. I talked about that heavy in the last episode as well. I, I appreciate that a lot. You know, when you're growing up, what did you dream to become? Like, what did you want to be? Because you talked about you did insurance at a, at a college and, and you're, you're working at a restaurant. I mean, but, and you said you love it, which is, which is dope too. But did you, did you think you were going to do that growing up? What did you want to become? No, um, I, I wanted to do a, a few different things. Um, for a while, I thought I was going to go into medical school. Uh, in fact, I got into nursing school out of high school. Um, but <laughs> here's that overproduction, mm-hmm. never reaching your goals thing. Uh, I applied for this rapid program to get into uh that's a two-year program and instead of four years and i didn't get into the rapid program i got into the regular program and i was pissed about that and i was like scrap the whole nursing nursing school idea if i have to go for four <laughs> years i don't want to do it um it's so that long. was it was too long i was like that just by the time and then i would have to take out extra student loans and stuff because i had to pay to, to try and make that happen so uh, scrapped that idea and was like, all right, let's just do something that will work for now. But the other thing that has always been on the forefront of my mind and still is on the forefront of my mind uh, is is cooking. I love to cook. Uh, and I was supposed to go to culinary school last year. Uh, and that was also something like whenever I played the if you won a million dollars game as a kid, it was like, what would you do with it? I would open a restaurant. Um, and that, still to this day, that's like forefront of my mind. I, I anticipate it further down the line at some point. It's not really in and if so much as a when I'm doing culinary Yeah, school, I could yeah, definitely completely. see you doing that. And and it, exactly, it's not if if you're going to open a restaurant, but when. And I always see you cooking on your social. So you're in a very like transformative phase right now. You you a couple of years ago when the pandemic started, which feels like yesterday, um, feels you switched like yesterday. from fitness. Yeah, well, you switched into fitness, and then that fitness took you even deeper into into being a coach and an athlete. And you took a boxing and got heavy into that and you still have that passion for for you know cooking and everything yeah. what kind of restaurant would you open Ooh, that's a hard question um probably like italian or mediterranean i would do something that is like coastal europe those are my favorite cuisines it's my favorite place to travel um and then it's kind of open to interpretation you could do a bunch of things you could do greek you could do italian you could do french if you're doing coastal um european but yeah i and it's the thing about um cooking and fitness is you really don't get into it to like make the big bucks like maybe one percent of the people who do fitness or who do culinary school or become a chef make good money it's it's a passion that's like those are the the types of jobs that are like i'm passionate about this this is something that fills up my cup so i'm doing it for that not for the monetary gain because typically those aren't like the highest paying jobs unless you're the one percent of the world that you know makes it big yeah so anyone listening right now somebody invest and partner up with christina and start a restaurant like yesterday <laughs> I, it, 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 <laughs> it's going <laughs> off, of, off of that passion i think we're starting to get to understand you and your mindset a little bit better too so even hitting all your passions and, and, and careers you went from insurance you went into fitness you're also passionate about cooking boxing did you start yeah. your 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 the pandemic actually yes yes i did um you know what's interesting is i started in the pandemic um i was dating this guy at the time um and he was firmly against it uh, that pushed me to do it even more because when i hear don't start it just makes me want to start um <laughs> uh-huh. yeah so i started in the pandemic um just to try and make extra money just to see if i could and i did make good money um, I recently signed with an agency um, for my. I want to stop saying it so you don't have to keep bleeping it out. For my. No, it's OS. okay. Um, and that kind of took it to the next level. Um, they helped me set up my photo shoots. They give me collaborations with other of their content creators. Uh, it's also given me a better platform to be able to connect with people. Um, and so since then, it's really taken off. But yes, it was a pandemic thing. Um, it was. 
I don't know, I, I need I knew I needed to get out of the job that I was in and I was making this transition and kind of betting on myself. It was like this leap of faith of like, okay, I'm gonna leave this stable nine to five where I make great money. Um, and I'm going to try and bet on myself and do something that I don't know if is going to pan out. Like I didn't have connections to the fitness world yet, or, or very few, um, just the people that had seen me at the gym working out or in like group fitness classes, but it wasn't like I was this known person where I could easily transition into it. It was kind of like a, all right, well, if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. So that was kind of just like a backup, like, okay, I'm going to bet on me, but it's nice to have some cushion and the OF was kind of that cushion. And it has been since. It's just like a nice little, it doesn't fill my cup, but it does, it, it's got some monetary value to it. I will say that much. Yeah. And it contributes to, you know, the overall aspect that you have now is you are a creator and not just on OF. You're a creator as far as the social content you put out there. You're always putting out, you know, talking about your mental health and, and, and mm. working with your therapist and the days that you have, the good days, the bad days, um, especially the good days that, that, that you have. I love seeing that where you're spending time with your roommate or you're going to the beach and you're cooking, like you're a creator and, and you're hitting all aspects of that. And, and that goes back to your roots on, on a, be, becoming a hustler and doing what it takes mm. and adapting to, to the environment that we're in now. It's, it's a creator creator economy and we're trying to do the best we can with what we got so i 1 million res 1 million percent respect that going into the next question now that we're starting to get to know you a little bit more and spending time with you the last year if there's one word that describes you for me it would be versatile mm. i think that's why we ended up connecting so well from the start most would stereotype and assume that female from los angeles she has an of good looking, gorgeous, big Instagram following, that that's your main motive that that, you know, you want to put out good content out there and, and, and build that following using that. But there's so much more behind that. I remember, at times, we're in the boxing gym, which is where we spend the most time together, there'll be 20 men in there. You're the only female, <laughs> yep. 20 men. It's mm -hmm. hot as shit. It smells like shit. You got world champion sparring. And, and you couldn't pay attention to anybody but yourself and how mm. hard you're working in there. And that's what mm. I truly Thank respect you. from you. And, and again, like how we really connected and, and built this friendship through, through boxing and, and, and more. Where does that all come from? Where do you get that confidence? Because it's, it, it's intimidating in there. Even for me, I'm a fighter. I'm a competitive fighter. I know what I'm doing. You know, there's always characters in there. Where, where does that come from, that confidence of being? First of all, thank you. That was so kind of you. Um, second, I, I wish I could pinpoint one exact thing and I'll do my best, but I think it's so multifaceted that question. And I think it comes from so many different things and so many different experiences. Um, for the most part, I think to be fair and to be honest, the very first time I walked into that gym, I think I did have some intimidation. I was a bit probably quieter or a little bit more intimidated than I definitely am now. Like now I walk in and I'm like, saying hi to, to, to all the guys sparring and whatnot. And it's, it's so different. But I think walking in, like, I have to admit, I was intimidated at first. But I don't think I was intimidated maybe as much as the next person might have been coming into a situation because you're right. Typically, I'm the only female in the gym. And that's, that's true of most of our sessions. And not only do I notice it, but I notice that it's noticed by other people. Like, I'll walk in and I notice the, the, the turning of, and the, of the heads. And I've mentioned it to you before and we'll joke about it. Um, and I think that used to be intimidating and now it kind of fuels the fire of, I have a seat at the table. And I think that all has come from, that inner confidence has come from um, no longer, and this is to be completely fair, just not giving a shit. And I know that that's not the most eloquent way that you could say that, mm -hmm. but I spent so many years of my life worried about what people thought about me, how I was being perceived. I felt like I was constantly being perceived like I couldn't walk down the street without people looking at me and I came to realize nobody gives a fuck everyone is so wrapped up in their own head in their own stuff they're not worried about me they're not worried about me walking like sure maybe they turn and they look and then they go right back to their day I'm not the main character in their story I'm the main character in mine but I'm not in theirs and there's so much confidence in knowing that nobody cares Nobody cares. Like they just simply are, are so wrapped up in their own stuff. The only way to get them to care is to show them or give them a reason to. So there's partially that there was the understanding of like, 
there isn't a target on my back. Not everyone's out to get me. Not everyone's out to 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 focus on me at all times. Um, and then it came from finally not seeking external validation and kind of making that validation for myself. I think my confidence comes from knowing that at the end of the day, when my head hits the pillow, I know that I wake up each day with the goal of making somebody's day better. It's it's part of my job. It's part of my mantra. It's part of my everyday routine. And knowing that and having the confidence of knowing like, regardless of what I look like, sound like, do, uh, at the end of the day, I, I respect the fact that I am a good person. I have enough self-love to be able to admit that in a, such a humble way. Um, and I think that's kind of where the confidence has stemmed from. I, I love the person that I have become. I love the person that I'm working towards. And I love that the people in my life remind me of that. And that brings me so much confidence. My inner circle, you um, multiple people on the daily telling me that I've impacted them or I've inspired them or I've motivated them. That brings me more confidence than I could even put into words. And I mean, how liberating is that feeling? Is that mm, you love like you it. love yourself like not what other people think about you does not affect you to the extent that it affects most. And mm you're so independent when it comes into that. And again, it goes back to your roots as you took something that was negative, your parents split it off and you turned it into something positive as in becoming independent and finding that hard work and hustle to get the things done, to get the things that you want. Like but how, to be how fair, incredible is that? Yeah, and thank you for acknowledging that. But to be fair, like I just want this to be noted for the record, that took a decade. That is an, and it's not over yet. You know what I mean? Like that wasn't an overnight change. It took it took depression. It took anxiety. It took crawling myself out of a place where I, I was at the complete opposite end of that spectrum. And it took feeling that and going through that and, and allowing myself to feel that to then get to the other side where I can stand up firmly and say, like, I, I did that. I did that on my own. And, and I have confidence in myself and knowing that when shit gets tough, I know that I have the ability to figure it out. When I am faced with some sort of obstacle or some sort of adversity, I have done it. I know that I am able to get myself out of it. So I walk into a boxing gym and I'm like, yeah, I'm the only female here. Fine. I've gone through a lot harder shit than that. <laughs> Yo, boxing's easy compared to life. Life is a life is a motherfucker. That's for sure. Ain't it? That, that's the <laughs> clip right there. Life is a motherfucker. Put it on a t-shirt. <laughs> no, but honestly, like that a lot of negativity from ourselves goes back to how we think about ourselves and mm. and the thoughts that we put in our head and our insecurities like most trolls that you see on the internet spreading their negativity in their comments it's it's a reflection of themselves and how they feel about themselves or i have friends had friends you know that i, I was close with and i branched off from them because their insecurities were starting to branch off onto me and their negativity like oh you Absolutely. shouldn't do that absolutely don't do that. I can't believe you're, you're trying to do that and start that business. I can't believe you're moving to New York. It's going to be the worst decision you've ever made. I'm like, yo, that's your insecurity. Don't reflect that onto me. Like I have done the work within myself where I love myself so much and I have full confidence in myself so much that I could get after the things that I want to get after. And that takes work. It and does. I always say this, before you can accept any compliment, and love from others, you need to be able to take in compliments and love from yourself. And you're a reflection Ooh. of that. Snap to <laughs> you, Jer. No, that's so go, accurate. Go. I have one thing before, before you, yeah. you go into this. Go, if you could go back to the first step you took to mm. start loving yourself, do you remember that? And what forced you to take that first step? I called the therapist. <laughs> Uh, I'm not kidding. That That is really what started my self-love journey. Um, I was really depressed and I couldn't figure out why. I couldn't figure out why I would wake up and have immediate anxiety. It was like I would wake up and I would take a deep breath. It was It was immediate. It was like the second I woke up, shit, another day. I have to work or I have to do this or I have to do that. It felt like the end of the world. And I knew that that wasn't right, um, but it took getting really seriously uncomfortable for me to say, okay, I need to make a change. Um, 
I remember when I called the therapist for the first time, I didn't know what to do. I had never gone to therapy before. Uh, so I like Googled therapist in my area and I called a couple of them. Uh, and the very first person I called is still my therapist to this day. And she asked, she had such a kind voice. She asked me why I was coming to therapy. And I said, I think I'm depressed and I think I have an eating disorder. And she said, why do you think that? Uh, and that kind of sparked um, what has now turned into an ongoing self-love journey. But it took kind of being in the depths of despair. It, it took the uncomfortable for me to say, I can't live like this anymore. I simply can't. I can't function in this way. Um, and that turned into kind of delving into why I do the things the way I do. It delved into why my body image um, affected me so much. It turned, it, it, it basically opened Pandora's box. I sat down and I did the hard shit, was, which is I looked internally. I looked at all the good, bad, and the ugly, and I decided what I wanted to say and what needed to go. And I think the most daunting thing about self-love or about therapy or about any sort of like self-growth is that it takes looking within and you know better than anyone that when that happens, when you look in, you're going to find some ugly shit. It's not easy. But once you're willing to confront it, that's the hardest part. Then you figure out what to do, what stays and what goes. It's the internal, the, okay, let's turn, let's, let's turn inwards for just a second and figure out what's there. And then from there, we'll figure out the rest. And then when you do it one step at a time like that, it's much easier to compartmentalize and to work through. But yeah, it took looking inward. And my God, was it ugly for a little bit. And then it turned beautiful. And here we are. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and exactly here we are. This is why we create the content. That's why we're doing this podcast is to share that story. And a lot of people um, deal with depression and, and, you know, insecurities and how they perceive themselves and loving themselves. It's like two things. You don't have to be at rock bottom to start to get help or you start to no, get on the right absolutely. path, right? If there's one way you could have done it earlier, if you could look back, you could hop in a time machine, go back to the times before you, you, you started to really hit rock bottom. Like what, what were the first couple of signs or that you wish you started going into therapy and working on your, on yourself and loving yourself? It goes back to what I said earlier of that external validation. Every, every validating thing in my life, every acknowledgement meant so much to me. Um, but none of it was coming from within. Like I couldn't look in the mirror and say, I'm so proud of me. That never happened. If other people said it, I was able to internalize that. And I was able to appreciate that. But never once did I look at myself and go, Christina, I'm so proud of you. You've been working so hard. You showed up today in a way that you didn't yesterday. You want to do better for yourself. These are things that I say to myself on the daily now. That was never the case before. It had to come from the external. And if it didn't, if I didn't get that validation from other people, you look good, you sound good, uh, you've impacted my day, I'm proud of you. If that didn't come from other people, it definitely wasn't coming from within. Um, and I, I felt low. I, I, w I wasn't able to sustain um, validation or happiness on my own. It, I, it had to come from outside. And if it didn't, I, that would m then my day would be ruined type of thing. So um, probably recognizing that, like, if you're not looking in the mirror and saying to yourself, damn, it was a tough day. We got through that. Or I'm, I'm really proud of myself for showing up at the gym today. I didn't really want to. Or whatever it is. I ate three meals today when my, my mind was telling me otherwise. Um, that never was happening. Um, but if you're in that place, kudos to you. And if you're not in that place, that's when I think that it, it might be time to make a change. If, if you're not able to do that for yourself, if all the external factors are gone at the end of the day, if you don't have your partner or your friend or whoever, are you able to look internally and tell yourself, I'm proud of you? That was kind of what it was. I never was able to do that before. That, that hit, I was getting goosebumps when you just talked about all that, because honestly, I've been in that position too. And, and I come from an industry where there are so many eyes on you. And, and mm. especially in New York City, the fitness world is, is very cutthroat there. And especially when group fitness was popping, popping, um, when, when we were at the height of it, like everything I did in that classroom, like down to like, and I would read reviews like, 
oh, he's boring or he's this and that. It's like, and I was so focused on what everyone thought of me is like, oh, I, I, am I wearing like the latest Jordans to class? Am I, am I really being, becoming a reflection of my style? And, and it wasn't until the, the, the pandemic and we were all isolated. I really had to focus on myself. So to anyone out there, if you're constantly relying on others to validate feelings and, and to get compliments from everyone, take a step back and really look within yourself and, and, and ask yourself, what are the things that I love about me? And, mm. and, and those are what's going to fuel me to, to keep pursuing my passion, keep pursuing what I want to get out there and keep pursuing what I want to do because if we don't love ourselves. And then, you know, what can we really do from there? It's similar to something I say in class pretty often. You almost said word for word what I say, which is if you don't love yourself, how is anybody else? If you can't show up for yourself, why should anybody else? And and it's true. It, it's why would you, and I'm not talking romantic partners and that's part of it too, but platonically work relationships. If you're not going to show up for yourself, why would you ever expect anybody else to? If you want to be loved a certain way, if you want to be shown up for a certain way, you have to show people how to do that. And that starts with you. It starts with the way you love yourself, the way you carry yourself, the way you talk about yourself, that shows other people how they're supposed to love, care, and show up for you. You are the first prime example of how other people can show up for you. So if you're talking shit about yourself, if you're not loving on yourself, if you're self-deprecating, that's how other people perceive you. That's how they assume they're supposed to relate to you. But if you show up with self-love, you show up with confidence, you tell people and show people through yourself how you deserve to be treated and loved and appreciated, they have no choice but to do that. They have no choice but to do the same exact thing because if they do the opposite, it's going to be blaring. Mm -hmm. You start by loving yourself and then you start doing the little things to, to elevate yourself. So you can start elevating those around you. And that's, you know, part of the Maya straight mentality that I preach. You elevate yourself so you can elevate those around you. And the main the main way that I do it, and it could be different for everyone, is is box and training. So yep. and that's how we connected from there. Oh man. So we kind of got into the third question a little bit. I mean, you've openly posted about your mental health and taking care of it on the daily. You posted the good days the bad days and are very in tune with your emotions, <laughs> how you're feeling. A mm -hmm. lot of us tend to ignore our emotions, sweep things under the rug. I want to dive deeper into how you confronted your traumas even more. And, and it goes mm -hmm. from, yeah, you said you were fed up and you called a therapist, but really peel it back even more. And what, what pushed you there? What made you really realize like I have an eating disorder, I'm depressed. I need to talk to somebody. Um, to be completely frank, it wasn't an, an internal thing. Um, I think I, I was uncomfortable for a long time and I knew I was uncomfortable, but I was dating someone at the time and it took him saying to me kind of that I was projecting my insecurities onto him, which I was, um, I would say or do things that affected my romantic relationship. And it got to a head where he was like, I want to show up for you and I want to love on you and I want to support you. But at the same time, I can only show up for you so much as you show up for yourself. And like, it's unfair to me that you are projecting these things onto me. And it took, it took somebody else looking in the eye and saying, you're hurting me by hurting you, you're hurting me. And I didn't understand that, that, that it was affecting other people. So interesting. I've talked about this in therapy before, but what got me into therapy wasn't that I was uncomfortable. It was that my uncomfortable was making other people uncomfortable, which is a whole nother topic. Um, but yeah, it took, it took, and I'm so glad that he was able to do that, but it took somebody else looking in the eye and saying like, you're hurting me at this point. And that was enough for me to say, okay, I don't want to hurt other people. It's so interesting. Like we're able to say hurtful, negative things about ourselves, things that we would never say to somebody else but it feels perfectly okay saying it to yourself. And that was kind of the same thing. I was fine with being uncom uncomfortable. I was fine with the fact that I didn't love the body that I was in. I was cool with all that. But as soon as I figured out that it was hurting somebody else, that it was affecting somebody else's day, that's when I finally made the decision, oh, something needs to change. Um, and it goes mm. straight back to that external validation. It goes straight back to needing to be able to look internally and be like, why, 
Why are we okay with treating ourselves this way? Why are you okay with talking to yourself in a way that you would never talk to one of your loved ones? And that was crazy. Kind of mind shift. You, you'll be you'll be fucked up to yourself, but when you recognize you're starting to be fucked up towards others, it makes you like, oh shit, what am I doing? But at the end of the day, it needs to start with yourself and not 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 by by others. <laughs> yeah, that's that. The mind fuck, the dot isn't it? starts to connect. Yo, yeah, but the dots start to connect, and you start to see like these basic and fundamental things, and how they start to affect us in the long run. I mean, it's it's incredible to see, and it's incredible to see your journey and 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 how you could openly speak about it. Because if this could help just one person, this is a W. You know, if this that could is, help one person, that's the mindset. That's the mindset right there. Because uh, you're right. You've mentioned it a couple of times. Like I, I, I frequently post on my social media, on my Instagram, uh, about my day, about the good days and about the bad days. And I will post a picture of me crying post therapy. And I will throw that up on my stories. And maybe half of the people think I'm doing it for the attention. Fine. I'm fine with people thinking that. The other half, though, there, there are so many messages that I get of people that are saying, like, thank you for the authenticity. Thank you for not just showing your good days, because it is so difficult to wrap your mind around that the people that we look up to that have these platforms or these large followings are human beings with real emotions who go through shitty things. And you're not seeing that. And I just want, I mean, I'm not showing you all my bad days and I'm not showing you all my good days. My social media is what I want you to see, to be completely honest. Of course, it's a facade, but I try to bring as much realness to it as I can, because there is someone at home that sees their favorite influencer or the person that they look up to having a hard day. And they might be sitting on the couch having a hard day themselves. And they're like, okay, this is normal. This is okay. I'm, I'm not othered. I'm a part of the group. This is, this is normalcy. And that the 1%, literally, I say that every day, if one person gets affected or changed for the better, I'm set. I'm filled. My cup is filled. This is why I love, you know, I started this, this podcast episode because, you know, the conversation that we're having now is a conversation that we would have after a training session or before a training session, <laughs> even sometimes during a training session when you try and get <laughs> some rest, you know, and, oh, and thanks for calling me out. No, it, it's very real. It's very real. And, and, you know, we peel back and, um, our emotions and, and, and our past and, and, and what we want out of the future and we share it. And, you know, we're just like everyone else, you know, it yeah. doesn't matter how many followers and how big we end up getting or collaborations we do and the people we hang out with, the celebrities in L.A. And being at the forefront of that is, is we're just we're, we're normal people with emotions I'm and, just, and Dina, traumas, too, yo. You're just Jer and we're doing the best we can every single day. And that's all there is to it. One and that million, changes that's daily. All we can, that's all we can really do is just do our best, love ourselves and constantly try to get better. And, and, you know, those were some damn, like I was getting goosebumps. You, you, you dropping those uh. bombs and it's making me reflect on myself and, and, and the things that I've overcome and the things and the things I want to overcome in the future as well. So I really hope that motivates others out there. Take, take things a little more relatable to boxing now and to li line things up. I mean, you really got into your boxing. Yeah. training this past year um yeah. give me you know if there's one important lesson boxing has taught you that you mm. want to share with others well what, what is that boxing has done a really good job of, of proving my resiliency to me um i think that it takes a very strong individual to to take something seriously uh it's proven to me that i can start from ground zero and I can get good at something. And I hadn't done that in a long time. I think like post high school or post college for some people, like our capacity for learning becomes very, very short. Like th there's no longer education unless you seek it out. And boxing kind of reminded me, it humbled me more than anything, um, that starting from ground zero is kind of the coolest thing ever. Watching the progress, having the sessions that you know I hate so much where we don't even throw the gloves on because we're shadow boxing the entire time because we need to focus on on the basics and we need to hone in and and solidify the things that we've worked on before it kind of it, it made me it forced me to step back for a second 
humble myself and say, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I need help. I need you to show me. I need to be taught. I'm interested in learning. I'm receptive. I'm open. Um, and then it also taught me resiliency, that when shit gets tough, when I'm tired, when we're on round 10 and you're going to make me hit the heavy bag, uh, and we've already done our shadow boxing and our mitt work and I'm drenched in sweat and it's me and 20 stinky men inside of a hot <laughs> ass boxing gym that I'm resilient and I am fucking strong and I show up for myself in ways that I used to wish other people would show up for me. So boxing is, is, is humbling, but it's also the epitome of strength and resiliency. And, and you hit the nail on the head right there. Like, Whatever that, whatever that saying is, that's right. My wife, I just remember my wife always makes fun of me for getting these sayings wrong. But regardless, <laughs> you hit it right there. The, the dopest thing about boxing, one of the dopest things about boxing is it doesn't matter how strong you are, how fast you are, how athletic you are. It really, all that matters is that you're willing to put in the work consistently over time. And if you Absolutely. do that, you will get better with it. It doesn't matter like male, female, how much you weigh, like, like all that the backgrounds you come, come from, your ethnicity, like as long as you put in the work, if you do this, this will happen. If you do that, you'll get better with this. And if you do it consistently, you'll see it get, you, you will become better with it at a quicker pace. And that's what I love about boxing. And I was never really good at boxing when I first started, but I was resilient like you and I was consistent like you. And in turn, I was able to to improve at a rapid pace from that. And I've kind of just now attached that to other things in my life. Like it, boxing is cool in that um, there's a, a physical um, accomplishment. Like you can see yourself getting better. You have more stamina. Your punches become faster. You're lighter on your feet. Like there are physical ramifications of hard work. Um, but what it also, it, it's back to what you said of that teaching you of like, when you are consistent, when you put in the work, when you're willing to put in time, energy, and effort, there are positive ramifications of that. And that's kind of been like encapsulated in the rest of my life. And like, I've watched myself grow over the last year physically because of boxing. So I know that mentally, if I do the same thing, if I stay consistent, if I put in the work, if I put in the energy, if I put in time in a relationship, whatever it is there will be a positive outcome. I, I've watched it happen. Yeah, you can't cut corners with boxing. And in turn, like, if you, like, face Absolutely. the fact of that and you start just doing things the right way, everything else, like, even for me, like, I was extremely respons irresponsible like, growing up, but, like, down to, like, the basic things, like like car registration and insurances and, and, and find like, you know, and, and I was, I was extremely too. immature, ignoring shit and, and boxing forced me to become more responsible with the things and, and having that peace of mind. So it bleeds into everything we do. Yes. Cause it's even like the, like, if you eat the wrong thing before you come in for a session or you went out and drank the night before, or you didn't get adequate sleep, your training differs. Like, the mm -hmm. way that you train, the way that you live your life, that's the way that you learn how to fight. Like it, it matters. It all matters. Yeah. And then when you, when you have a job like yours and when you're coaching, you know, handful of people all at once that you want to be at your 100%, you know? And, yeah. and so what are you doing the night before? What are you eating the day before? Are you hydrated? Are you taking care of your voice? How was your programming for that day? There's so much that ties into it. Yeah. You hit the nail on the head that, on that one, Jerry. Yeah. Oh, so I did say the saying right. Yeah. I, <laughs> I want to know what the saying was before. Annie's going to give you shit for that. And I really want to know. And, yo, <laughs> she'll probably clip, Annie will clip this if she sees it, but it was, um, I'm putting myself on blast here. It was like <laughs> the saying, like, oh, they're on the chopping block. And I that's was like, on, oh, yeah. Yeah. I didn't say right? that. Yeah. It is, that's say what that, I was saying. Right. But yeah. but at one time I was like, oh yeah, that person's gonna be in so much trouble. They're on the cutting board right now, <laughs> and she just—I think she actually did like uh, a, okay. a Instagram. Story. I do a lot of those things. I, I butcher well, a lot of them. To be fair, it's the right <laughs> idea. It's just the wrong execution. <laughs> oh, uh, I, I I love her for it, but yeah, no, I love myself. So that that's not gonna break me down. <laughs> there he is. We don't need external validation for nothing. Oh my gosh, you're doing incredible things, Christina. I really am grateful for the friendship that we built, 
through the last few years, started boxing, but we, we've been able to spend a lot of time together. You even came to my three-year-old's birthday party. Um, that, I, that means a lot to me. You're doing great things, coaching boxing, elevating your own boxing on the daily. You know, you coach boot camps. You're putting your content out there, whether, you know, it's on your OF or whether it's talking about your mental health and, and, and helping shape others to become better. Eventually, you're going to open your own restaurant and it's going to be successful because it's going to be fueled off your passion. You know, Thanks, uh, how, how, how do people follow your message even more? Instagram. So, yeah, I got TikTok, Instagram. YouTube. Um, I'm on TikTok, but I'm not really on TikTok. Instagram would be the best place to, to really stay connected to me. Um, it's just my name, Christina with a K, underscore, and then my last name, which is Ewing, E-W-I-N-G. Um, and then if, if anything else, if was interest that we had mentioned today, the link is in the bio for the Instagram for that as well. Um, but yeah, link mainly in I'm on bio. Instagram. I had to say it, I had to throw it in there just like quickly at the end. Let me just toss it in. There absolutely. For, no, for some absolutely. Fun. Um, but yeah, Instagram is the number one way you can, uh, see my boxing. You can see my boxing with Jerry. You can hear me talk about my bad and good mental health days. You'll see me cook. There's a lot that goes on. Versatile. I like the word, Jerry. Yeah. I'm going to steal it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of substance in today's episode. I hope everybody enjoyed. Christina, thank you again. Thank You're you, incredibly Dad. amazing. I will see you in a session soon. And everybody, you know, follow Christina on her journey. Drop those comments and subscribe if you like today's episode and let us know what you thought. And if it helped you, that most importantly, if it helped you and you don't let us know, I'm going to be extremely offended. I'm going to be, we're not friends after that. If you don't tell us. <laughs> I appreciate you, yo. Thank you. Thank you, Jer. Bye, guys.